Well, good morning, everyone. It's right up 8 o'clock. I think we'll get started. I am Kathleen Fitzpatrick. I'm the Senior Program Manager for NAEP and um, a member of this team who's been working on the Make the Future, increasing the participation of females in advanced manufacturing pathways. Um, this is a project that is near and dear to my heart, my first career. Uh, out of college, I was the only woman uh, process engineer on the production floor at Hewlett Packard here in Colorado Springs and spent uh, the first 12 years or so of my career working in manufacturing. So getting more women interested in advanced manufacturing career paths is definitely an area that I'm trying to make an impact. So excited to be part of this project. Um, this morning, we are going to be um, talking about one of our nine strategies, uh, create exploration experiences for targeted students. Um, but first, I want to give those of you who are um, new to our table talks a little bit of background and some expectations for what's going to happen this morning. Um, the um, the table talks, I will give you a little background about um, the project, and then we will be asking our guest facilitator, Karen Peterson, to share some of her knowledge and experiences around this particular topic. And then we'll, we'll have an opportunity for us to have a uh, roundtable discussion. So um, as you have questions, um, either for myself or uh, for Karen as she's speaking, um, go ahead and put your questions in the chat box and we will address them as they come up. And um, at the end, we'll turn on the microphones for everyone, especially if we have a small group and um, can have a conversation about this issue. Um, to give you a little bit of background about the project, uh, the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity has been tasked by the uh, Toyota Foundation to work with educators and recruiters in a chosen network where we can learn and share best practices to increase participation in advanced manufacturing pathways. Um, the tools and strategies that we've developed can be used with students and parents at the K-12 as well as community college levels to increase participation and retention of females and students of color in STEM, CTE, and uh, particularly those uh, courses leading to a career in advanced manufacturing. As those of you who are here I'm sure know, advanced manufacturing faces a serious skills gap that could be solved by the inclusion of women and people of color. Uh, but a demographic shift in the manufacturing workforce will require a significant outreach effort with both students and parents. This project uh, focuses on increasing the capacity of educators at feeder high schools and community colleges in targeted North American communities that have advanced manufacturing technician or what we call AMT programs to implement research-based effective outreach strategies. The collateral tools and strategies developed as a result of this project will also be made available nationally and leveraged through NAEP's current professional development activities being implemented across the nation. So we are excited that you all are here and that your organization has partnered with us on this important project and look forward to the work ahead. The, let's see, if, there we go. Um, so we are partnering with recruiters and educators from seven states. Um, they'll be engaged in this project and we are piloting in those, uh, with those partners. Um, we are ready to provide opportunities for you all to learn and network with each other. And so that's part of what we're doing here today with this table talk. Our partners were selected strategically so that the participating high schools are most often also feeder schools for the AMT uh, programs in the project. So we hope to enrich existing relationships, um, allowing you all to talk to each other and uh, establish new ways to engage and recruit female students to educational programs aimed at building tomorrow's advanced manufacturing workforce. 
So just to give you a, a broader overview, we have developed a suite of tools and resources that you will be able to access through our learning management system. The first module is to introduce you to the NAEP courses and help you frame their content through the lens of advanced manufacturing. The, um, the, you can see the other ones, we have uh, several courses, the STEM pipeline um, online course, the micro messaging online course, as well as non-traditional careers online courses that are available for you to access through our learning management system. The, um, we have a networking space for folks to share best practices, as well as a YouTube channel with videos related to equity and advanced manufacturing. Um, and opportunities for those of you who are partnering with us to attend the annual training at the uh, National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity um, National Educational Equity Summit, as well as the Federation for Advanced Manufacturing Education or FAME conferences. Um, today we are going to talk about the best practices. Um, so let me just quick give you an overview of the nine best practices. We also have a uh, uh, handout in the materials section of your control panel that is the nine best practices complete summary. Um, as you can see here, we've got an inspire section that talks about reaching out to middle school, elementary schools using invitations. Um, today, we're going to be talking about creating exploration experiences for targeted students. Um, in future table talks, we will address the other six um, topics that you see here. Um, you can access the information looking at the nine best practices. Um, it, within that document, there's also samples and um, uh, strategies as well as suggestions what to do and not what and what not to do, as well as resources that you can use with your students and family. So uh, given that introduction, I would like to now um, ask Karen Peterson to join us. So let me tell you a little bit about Karen. I've worked with Karen. In fact, I worked with Karen before I came to NAEP uh, because I'm also involved in a girl STEM initiative here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. But um, so excited to have Karen here. Karen is the chief executive officer for the National Girls Collaborative. She has over 25 years of experience in education as a classroom teacher, university instructor, teacher, educator, program administrator, and researcher. Currently, she's the principal investigator for the National Girls Collaborative Project in GCP. Um, uh, Karen designed this project. It seeks to uh, maximize access to shared resources for public and private sector organizations interested in expanding girls' participation in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. The overarching goal of NGCP is to use the leverage of a network or collaboration of individual girl-serving STEM programs to create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. Currently, 33 collaboratives serving 41 states facilitate uh, collaborations between 36,000, over 36,000 organizations, so quite a big network. So given that, I would like to uh, turn the podium over to Karen. Um, Karen, I'm going to make you presenter, and let's see if you can share your slides, and if that doesn't work, I will take back control. All right, S such power. So, yeah, so I am going to change presenter to you. And uh, just so you know, you'll have an option which screen to sh that you want to share your, your uh, slides on and it'll... Um, oh. Oh, so wait, so I need to open my own slides from my own computer. Um, Yes, if you like, or again, I can just go from here. If yeah, if. let's go back. Let's go back because I didn't okay. have mine open. I didn't realize. Okay. It. I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Okay, great. Well, good morning, um, everybody. Oh, it'll come back, won't it? In a minute. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Let me get. 
Okay, I'm moving to Karen's slides. And I'll just say go. next. I'll just say next slide. Thanks, Kathleen. Well, good morning, Here. everybody. It's great. There we go. It's great to be with you. I was excited to be able to share this with you, and I love the idea of having a table, a virtual table talk. Um, as Kathleen said, um, I manage the National Girls Collaborative Project, and um, through that project, we provide um, pra practices, best practices, and all sorts of resources to programs across the United States. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about NGCP and then um, share some specific uh, strategies around this strategy three that we're talking about today. So as Kathleen said, um, the National Girls Collaborative Project is a large national project across the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our vision, and it really is about bringing people together. When we started this project about 16 years ago, um, we had found that there were many organizations that were serving girls um, who didn't know each other, they weren't connected to um, universities or corporations or other community-based organizations. And as we um, created this project, we talked to many educators who would ask us like, well, how, how do I get in touch with Boeing? How do I get a speaker from Boeing to come to my classroom? Or, you know, I'd really like to take, take the students in my class uh, up to the university to learn more about what it's like to be a college student. How, how do I get in touch with them? And so our vision really is about connecting all those people together so they can better serve young people. Next slide, please. So this is our history. As I said, we've been around about 16 years. Um, we started in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we created our model uh, here in Washington and Oregon. And, um, and then as we made presentations and talked about this framework, this sort of connective um, system that we created between programs and all the different stakeholders that care about getting more young people interested in the STEM, um, we had people come to us and say, you know, my state needs that. How can, how can we learn how to do this? So we tested our model, we replicated it in California, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin. And then um, since that time, we've had uh, two national grants, all funded by the National Science Foundation. And, um, you know, NAEP is one of our biggest collaborators. We've been uh, working alongside NAEP for most of this time. Um, and that's where we um, have formed additional collaborative leadership teams in states. And then actually now we're working globally um, with, we have an Australia collaborative. Um, we're starting a, a Canadian collaborative. Um, and then uh, we're talking with some partners in Europe as well. So what we found as we've done this is that many people, and you know, you're, you're here today to get information. They need in information. They want to connect with colleagues. And it sounds like a very simple thing, but actually you have to take the time uh, to reach out and connect. And we try to provide ways to do that. Next slide, please. So these are our goals, and as I as I talked to you about how we created this model, you can see that these are the goals we first created, and they still hold true today, that we're really interested in maximizing access to the resources within organizations that are interested in engaging girls in STEM. Um, and while we have girls in our title, um, many of the programs that we serve also serve boys. Um, the programs in our network serve about 20 million girls and uh, also about 12 million boys. And you all know that these strategies that we're talking about today and the strategies that um, you use in your classrooms, the ones that work for girls also work for boys. We strengthen the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practice research. And that's why I was so excited to be in, invited um, on this webinar today because it's part of our mission. Um, and then as Kathleen said in the introduction, we really want to use this leverage of a network, as many people connected as possible to achieve gender equity in STEM. Next slide, please. So this is one of the ways that we share exemplary practices. We call them network projects. And throughout the 41 states where we have collaboratives, we have uh, trainers and educators who are offering, um, it's a train the trainer model, and they're offering content 
uh, out to educators in their states. Um, and this is just a, a few, actually, of the programs that we're working with. I'm a co-PI on SciGirls. Hopefully, you all know about SciGirls. Um, we're actually wrapping season five on SciGirls, which is about coding. Um, and so we train educators in using the strategies. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Um, the strategies that SciGirls has created for engaging girls. We work with the California Academy of Sciences on a project they have called Science Action Club. Uh, TechBridge is a program, um, actually it's a national program that serves girls in after school clubs. And if any of these are uh, seem interesting to you, you can always uh, reach out to me after the webinar. I'll put my email address and our website in the chat box in just a minute. Um, I'd love to tell you more about um, any of these programs. The, uh, the Our newest one is the Cyber Sleuth Science Lab, which is a digital forensics uh, curriculum for middle school girls. Next slide, please. So um, my task was to talk with you about strategy three, create exploration experiences for targeted students. And so I'm going to highlight just three areas um, of that strategy, some tips and some resources to help you as you think about creating these experiences. I know strategy four is about specifically about role models, but I wanted to um, bring it into this discussion as well since uh, we, there's more and more research that demonstrates, and I know through your experiences, I'm sure you've, um, you've seen this as well, that role models are very powerful uh, for young people, actually for, for all people, but especially for young people as they're considering um, their future in STEM. Next slide, please. So let's first talk about setting. Um, and the, the environment, the place where you're going to have this exploration experience. I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm hoping that even though we're a small group, um, you'll type in the chat box your answer. Um, what do you think about this uh, image I have here on this uh, PowerPoint? Live giant robot fight. Is that an image that um, you think would be helpful? Um, inspiring, exciting. What do you think about that image as you think about creating an environment um, for um, uh, exploration experience? Not so, Frida says, not so inviting for the girls in my high school. Luke says, that's right, it's not really Luke, but Luke says, I think it feels too big. I don't see how I'd be able to participate. All right. Um, it looks scary. That's right. So, you know, along with thinking about planning your event and invitations and all of those sorts of things, you want to think about the way that the room, wherever you're having this event, is set up and the design and the messaging, right? And I know that I recently spoke to um, educators in robotics, and we talked about messaging and the flyers that they use to recruit students to their uh, clubs and their activities or competitions. And they seemed very surprised when I said that a giant robot is not necessarily inviting or engaging. Um, it, it could be to boys, um, but it's definitely not engaging to girls. And so to really think about what, you know, what are the messages that you're sending in the room that you're having this event? And right, Frida says, fighting is not the way many females want to change the world. That's right. And and we know from research that girls care about the world. Um, they want to make a difference. And, and so having images that are about fighting or just are, and there's no people, people in this um, are not necessarily as inviting or welcoming. What about the room setup? What about thinking about, you know, whatever you're doing, how you have your room set up? How would you see that as a welcoming, inviting environment? Would you um, put all your desks in, a, in rows? Oh yeah, I like that, the spectator versus active participant. I, 
I would do a circle or small tables for three or four. That's right, exactly. I know that I always, no matter what I'm doing, if I'm going into a classroom um, or working with adults, I always ask for round tables or circles. It's just, it's very difficult to feel engaged, you know, if you're in a classroom in rows. And and it's it's really it's really interesting how many people it doesn't occur to them. You know, they're they're very subtle things, and you know, from the NAPE training on micro messaging, they're very subtle things that can make a difference. So often, when I ask for round tables um, for whatever kind of activity I'm doing with young people, the organizers will say, "Well, you know, the room is already set up in rows. Can you can you just can you can you just work within that?" And I've learned that I've had to say, "Well, no, <laughs> actually, no. I really." I really need round tables or I rearrange the room when I get there. And so when you think about event planning, um, I always allow time to get to wherever I'm going early if it's not my own room, right, my own classroom, um, get there early. And because I, often I have to rearrange things and sometimes I have to be pretty assertive about it, but it provides a much better um, experience for everybody. Uh, next slide, please. So now I wanted to talk about the activity, whatever the activity is that that you might be doing, some hands-on activity. Um, I, certainly, there might be times when you have to demonstrate something, um, but think about you know how you how you group your students, and especially in mixed groups, you know there's there's research and evidence around. Um, Often what happens sort of naturally in a mixed group is that the girl will become like the note taker, right? Or she'll, she won't be the person that manages the computer or uh, is the leader in a group, just naturally. And so you often have to engineer that. You have to set up roles in advance, or you have to, um, if there are say four different roles, make sure that all the students in the group take a turn at each role. Um, I. You know, I was looking for a good photo to put on this slide. And so I found this photo and I, I left the label on there. It's a stock photo from a, you know, stock, um, some photo place. I can't remember where I got it. It wasn't Getty, some some other place. And what what about this photo? I mean, it was actually a photo you could buy. Like I could have paid money for this photo. What do you think about this photo? Yep, the boys in charge, right? And the girls are standing behind. Um, yeah, I would not, I would not use this photo, but it's also something that actually often happens naturally in classrooms. And and the boy is serious, and the girls are surprised. Oh, that's yeah, I like that. The you can see the facial expressions. Um, and and also when you think about your activity, you know what what the <laughs> students are are going to do. Somebody have a question? All right, just heard some feedback. All right. Um, when you think about, you know, what what's going to happen? Um, oh yeah, Frida, you pointed out they're all, yes, they're all they're all same race and cultural background. I actually think I think the title of this was something about private school. So I think they're wearing uniforms. Um, but when you think about making sure that your students actually build their skills, right? within that exploration experience, right? Everybody, then you want all students to have a chance at whatever the task is. You want everybody to, to take a turn so that they can experience whatever that task is. Um, the other thing we know from research is that um, students want a choice. So, I mean, you can't always uh, invite students to an exploration experience, say, what do you want to do? But you can have a choice of, say, two activities or three activities. And choice we, has been determined as very important in terms of engaging interests, right? Um, so you can say, we have this activity over here and we have this one over here. You can choose which one you want to do or everybody's going to do both activities. But you can pick which one you want to do first. Um, and to, to actually think about, you know, within whatever that activity is, you know, in this amazing environment that you've created, um, you know, what 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 is the context that you can pro provide? Um, I like to tell the story about um, a study that I did a really long time ago with sixth grade girls where um, 
they were studying, they were learning more about technology. And um, I, I had like, you know, the control group and then um, the, the, the test group. And in one group, I said, so we've got all these computers, we're going to take them apart and just take them apart and stack them up over here so we can use the spare parts. And the girls did not want to do that. They didn't want to take the computers apart. Um, they weren't interested in it. They were whiny about it. They did not want to do it. Um, and then with this other group, I said, we're going to send these computer parts um, to the school in Africa with young people that don't have access to computers. And then they're going to build, they're going to use the parts to build computers. So can you help me take these apart? Um, and everybody jumped right in because I gave them context. I gave them a reason for doing that activity. So it's really important to think about, you know, with this activity that you're doing, why, why, why are you um, doing this hands-on activity? And, you know, I realized that um, there's one bullet I didn't put up there that I almost always put there, and that is to make it fun. Um, when you're exploring possible careers and doing hands-on activities, really think about how you can make that a, a fun experience for students. What else? What else are you thinking about when you think about having an activity for students when they're exploring careers? What's something else that you would want to include? You could just type in the chat box. Yeah, definitely hands on. Definitely hands on. I think more and more, you know, um, we we try to avoid doing anything that's sort of, you know, talking head. Um, we really want to think about having students experience things and try things. Um, having a humanitarian focus, absolutely. Thinking about how will this activity that I'm doing, how does that represent a career? How does it help people? And that's, and again, that's good for all students. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, how does an activity tied to careers? What about the computer forensics career tied to taking apart computers? If, exactly, exactly. And you know, Kathleen, in our um, in our digital um, forensics um, project that we're working on, um, the role models in that project sometimes they're not available because they've been approached by the court or lawyers for a case, and they actually have to like go in and recover. Um, information from from a hard drive. It's it's very exciting, sort of hands on, and we always make sure we have backup role models because it happens where they'll say, "Oh, I just got pulled in on a case, you know, and I have to go into a secure room and open up this hard drive to get um, information out." Great. So I want to say a little bit about um, the learning environment um, and some of the uh, latest research around. Um, learning environment. And I also put up there um, the, the Sci Girls 7. If you don't know anything about uh, the Sci Girls 7, uh, you, you can um, search on the web for it. Um, th this is um, through our five seasons of Sci Girls. Um, these are research based strategies. Uh, we tried to make them um, easy to remember. Um, if you uh, go online, if you're interested in these strategies, uh, you can find a much longer version. We have um, guides that list all of these uh, strategies, the research behind them, um, and examples of activities, uh, projects that are connected to all of them. And, you know, as educators, as you look at those, they all make sense, right? They all make sense. Uh, but we found that, you know, as we were rolling out um, the Sci Girls, uh, television series, uh, I guess it's on the web now, also web series, that it was helpful to have these sorts of um, cards and strategies sort of outlined for educators, especially since a lot of the Sci Girls um, uh, work activity happens out of school time. Um, so often we find that professional development is uh, really important. So I just highlighted these two studies that are fairly new around the learning environment. And 
you know, if your learning environment looks and feels inviting, it allows girls to belong, to feel like they belong there. And in that way, they can envision themselves perhaps in that career. And I want to make sure I'm I'm watching the chat box too. Oh, thank you, Kathleen, for putting the Sci Girls um, link in there. Great, great. Um, and also, and we talked about this right on the previous slide, making sure that um, it's personally meaningful. So let me just tell you, I have a little note here about the Samet and Kakelis paper. Um, that paper discusses the best practices and learnings um, from TechBridge, which is a program I mentioned earlier. And um, there are two main recommendations in, in that paper, and that's to provide girl-centric and culturally responsive out-of-school time STEM opportunities. And again, um, the the topics that you bring up that are girl-centered are also good for boys. It doesn't mean that boys will not be interested in them. Um, and so in this paper, they talk about designing safe, inclusive learning environments that look and feel inviting and allow girls to feel like they belong in it. Um, and offer also to offer collaborative learning opportunities and opportunities to build trusting relationships. Um, what about all the programs on the list presented early in the presentation? Um, I actually, I can, um, I'll, I'll put my email address in there. I'm happy to provide uh, information about any of those programs to anybody that's interested um, in learning more about them. Thank you very much, Kathleen, putting my email in there. Um, and, and I mean, everything that the National Girls Collaborative Project does is free. Um, we have national webinars. Um, we'll connect you to people that are doing these um, projects. So if you're not, it sounds like some of you aren't connected into us, um, please write to me and we'll we'll connect you right into um, our community because, you know, as I said at the beginning of this, we're we're about connecting people to resources and to other people. And so we're happy to to do so. Um, and then the pers the personal personally meaningful paper. Um, so that that paper is, is was really fascinating, and actually, I can share some of these papers too if you're interested in um, reading more about it. And that Redinger and Taylor paper explored how 12 middle school girls developed science identities, and I'm going to talk a little more about identity um, on the next slide. You're getting just little snippets of information this morning. Um, it, it was a residential camp, and of course, what luxury is that, a residential camp, where girls engaged in hands-on and field-based science activities, um, and they found um, themes uh, that positively influenced girls' science identities. And one of those themes was providing a comfortable and personally meaningful space. Okay, next slide, please. Great. So now I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about STEM identity research. Again, just some little snippets of information. And a, of course, I'm happy to um, share the papers with you. Um, we're working on a national webinar series. We're going to be highlighting um, some of the latest research. There's new research that builds upon some of this as well. Um, but when you and you probably heard about um, the interest in STEM identity. And that's because, you know, if you if you think about, I think a common phrase is, if you can't, you know, if you can see it, you can be it, right? Um, this idea that in order to envision yourself in a career, you, you have to feel like you belong there, like you have that identity. Um, and that's part of these providing these um, exploration experiences is that you want to give young people an opportunity to see if they could belong in this career, if they feel connected to this career. And so that the first study actually is not a new study, but it's fairly foundational about how the development of a STEM identity is, is how you see and align yourself and how others see you. Um, um, and the second one is all around how your STEM identity and your personal identity intersect, right? So when we talked about connecting um, an activity or an exploration experience to personal interests, that's exactly what this study um, 
has sort of ver verified and validated, right, that your STEM identity is not separate from who you are as a person, right? And that you have to recognize that with students when you're working with them, that those go together. So you might even say, you know, how many students in this room are interested in, you know, uh, sports or whatever, and, um, you know, connect that to what you're doing if people are interested in sports, right? Um, a friend of mine actually is doing a project around the science of sports. It's very exciting. She's working with the, I, I live in Seattle, and she's working with the Seahawks. Um, it's kind of a fun project. Um, and then that that last bullet there is about um, how the research really suggests that developing a STEM identity is very important to for girls choosing careers, right? That they have to see themselves as, oh, maybe I, I could uh, work in manufacturing. Maybe I could be a scientist. And they have to see themselves as doing that before that they consider um, getting involved in court STEM courses and activities and potential careers. I'm going to stop for a minute and see if you have any questions about, I kind of threw out, um, what, 10 years of studies there in three bullets. Uh, but again, I'm happy to um, send you the papers or uh, send you to uh, additional resources that talk more about this. What, what questions do you have? Oh, what are some practical ways <clears throat> to help girls develop STEM identities? So uh, that, that's a great question. So, so actually, one of the, the best ways, and it's actually a good segue into the next part of this presentation, is via role models and um, via site visits, right? Um, helping girls and all students actually see themselves by talking to people that are in those careers. And specifically hearing those people describe their path, how they got interested in that, um, you know, what, what they did as a young person. That's one of the, the easiest ways and most practical ways. Of course, finding the role model can be uh, challenging sometimes. I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna give you a resource that'll help you with that. Um, I think also another practical way is to whatever this activity is that you're designing, make sure there's space in that activity for students to talk about what they're interested in, right? So when we talk about seeing yourself as a STEM person, um, one of the things we're discovering in our digital forensics project is that, um, that I mean, that's a complex topic and we're working with middle school girls, right? It's a National Science Foundation grant. So we've designed some activities around things like gra grandma has lost her cat. Grandma has lost her cat, right? Um, which you wouldn't think is is connected to digital forensics, but basically, you know, we um, use the digital forensic tools to help the student help grandma in this scenario find her cat, right? Through um, through uh, um, some kind of cool um, mystery. Um, I, I'm trying to use the word word stalking, but ways to find where the cat has been. Right. Great. And Kath Kathleen is confirming some of the research around informing the strategies. Let's go to the next slide. I want to make sure we have time for discussion. Great. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Fab Femmes project. Uh, so the Fab Femmes project was developed out of a need identified through our National Girls Collaborative Project work. Um, you know, we work with programs so often and they would want to bring professionals into their classrooms and they couldn't find role models. Um, they didn't know where to reach out if they didn't have a strong relationship with a company, a local company. Um, and then we also heard from many women and men, actually, that they wanted to volunteer. They wanted to be role models, but they didn't know how to, how to do that, right? They, they didn't know how to reach out to programs. They didn't know where they were. So um, we created Fab Femmes um, to address these barriers and to connect role models 
and programs and teachers together um, to create successful STEM experiences for girls. Um, and so our main tool actually is our website, if we could go to the next slide, and it's called, it's fabfems.org. And this is a role model directory. Um, uh, right now we have about, I think there are about 1,300 role models in this directory. It's actually international. Um, you've got the uh, URL right there. It's, again, it's free. Um, we have role models from not every state, but many states. Um, many of the programs that we uh, work with uh, have a role model component that's required. And, um, and so we recruit role models for the directory so that programs can find them. So you can go in there and you can search. You can search by state. You can search by keyword. Um, you, you'll get lost in there reading the amazing stories of um, women that um, are involved in great careers. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, another sort of resource that you might use as you're thinking about creating this exploration experience. And I'm not gonna talk too much more about role models because I know that's your next table talk, uh, but I, it's really difficult for me to envision a successful exploration experience that does not have some kind of role model component. Um, one more thing I want to say about Fab Femmes is that we ask the role models to, um, oh good, Kathleen, you're asking the question that I'm going to answer right now. We we ask them to indicate their level of uh, availability. So you'll see in there that they'll say, um, I'm available to, to come in to your classroom in person. I'm available to Skype. And again, virtual, the virtual role models, that happens all the time. Um, we have this amazing role model in Alaska. She's a pilot and she's, she Skypes in all the time because she, she doesn't come down to the lower 48 very often, but uh, she's always available to Skype. Skyping. And one time she was like sitting in the cockpit of her plane. It was very exciting. So yes, they're available. And then, of course, there's some role models who aren't as available as others, but they tell their story. And so we actually uh, work with them on their profile to make sure it's engaging um, and, and just reading that story. We also have um, on the back end, uh, girls can write to role models. That's all moderated. Um, we um, monitor that the emails kind of go back and forth. It's a very safe environment. Um, and I'm gonna ask you a question. What do you think is the number one question that girls ask role models through that backend system? They ask them a question. What do you think that question might be? Kathleen says, was it hard to get to where you are? No, that's not the number one question. Let's have one more guess and then I'll tell you. No more guesses? Who or what inspired you? What do you have to dress up for work? Oh, great. No, the number one question is, what's your favorite color? Isn't that amazing? What's your favorite color? We actually had one role model say, I don't know how to answer this question. I said, you know, this girl, I think she was like an 11-year-old girl, she pushed that contact button, and um, and many, many of them do it. We've been running this directory for about seven years. Um, they, they just want to make a connection, right? What's your favorite color? And I said, do you write back and say, um, my favorite color is whatever, green, and what's yours? And then they start uh, communicating. Um, uh, the second most asked question is, do you have a pet? Um, and these are middle school girls. We certainly have these other questions also. And um, we don't have as many uh, young women take advantage of the email option. I mean, we do have, you know, over the years, we have many, many um, connections that have happened there. But the primary goal of the directory is to help you find um, a role model that you can invite to your classroom. And, um, and the other thing that we offer is um, 
if if you don't find a role model in your area, let us know because we're doing outreach all the time. We work really closely with um, the Society for Women Engineers and um, other uh, female professional organizations. Um, we have a new partnership with the um, American Institute of Architects. Um, and so they're working on getting as many female architects in there um, as they can. And so it's growing. It's growing all the time. And uh, in fact, we just received um, a, a new grant to add a digital repository to the FabFems uh, directory. So we'll have many more photos and videos. And that will all be free um, for folks to use as well. Next slide, please. So that's um, my content for today. Now I'd love to um, answer any other questions or if there are things you were hoping to uh, learn about that I didn't cover, I can direct you to resources. Uh, Frida says, uh, the middle school first wants to connect to her on a level, say hello and who you are really. Yes, that's true. That's I love telling that story because I think often, you know, we think that um, students, they do want to know like what your salary is or what you have to wear to work. But often the first thing they want to know is, you know, are you a person like me? Uh, can I relate to you? Can I connect with you? And, and that's really the theme in creating these exploration experiences, right? Is that you want to help students connect to whatever these careers are that you want to introduce. And, and you know, we, we also do role model training um, through the FabFems project. Uh, we're, um, we're almost done with an online module because we find that often many amazing uh, role models, both men and women, um they they jump right into their job and their career and um you know it's it's helpful to start with a little bit about who you are and um what your hobbies might be right and and to talk about about your the path that you took that could be really helpful to students oh you want me to talk more about the girls only events challenges what about the boys question so what we you know we don't ever say girls only while certainly um, there's research that says it could be helpful for girls to be in an all all girls environment, it could be very um, um, they can be more open and they can feel more comfortable. Um, the research doesn't say that the only way a girl can get interested in STEM is to be in an all girls environment. Um, so it's it's really more about managing that experience. Um, so, you know, often, I mean, there's some challenges around um, funding in, in federal, um, uh, in schools, right, um, and being able to have um, girls only events. So what we do is, um, you know, your messaging might be clear that this is uh, an event that is designed for girls, but boys are welcome. We have um, boys that come to Sci Girls events. Um, and then these, as I've said before, these strategies and resources, they all work for boys. They help boys as well, right? So um, if there are boys there, it's not gonna be a thing that is going to, um, it's not gonna be a detriment, right? Um, and I think it's very helpful for boys to see female role models. So I would say as much as possible, if you can find female role models for whatever you're doing, that that can be very helpful generally. Um, oh, Maddie and Tracy. So it'd be great to hear, you know, what you're doing in your recruiting events and if this is helpful. Should we um, unmute people, Kathleen, or maybe you already have? So the question is, does this confirm what you're doing? Um, does, has this generated new ideas? And both of those are great, right? If you said, wow, this is what we're already doing, good, go forth and continue doing it. Um, if it sparks some new ideas, that's great. I think Tracy is is still muted. All should be unmuted. Yeah, she's. It says self muted. Yep. Yep. Oh. Okay, Tracy. 
shared with uh, us you've covered the step currently being applied at recruiting. Well, great, good. That's helpful. <laughs> I hope that's helpful. I don't know if 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 you're if you're being successful, then hopefully you are being su successful. Um, I I just find really that messaging piece when you're recruiting is really important. Yeah, what's been the most effective? I would love to hear that too. What recruiting steps have been the most effective? I know often, you know, I do workshops around this topic and, um, you know, we, we, we sometimes dissect, you know, we had a great event and we didn't have as many people show up as we wanted. Why was that? Um, I mean, sometimes there are challenges just in terms of uh, the choosing the, you know, the calendar, right? Really being aware of all the variety of holidays or things that people might be doing. Um, you know, one of the best practices around if you're having an event, say, after school or in the evening and you want families to attend as well, to make sure that you're uh, providing child care. Um, oh, yeah, Tracy, it'd be great to hear your voice. Uh, Kathleen wants me to talk more about, I've been talking generally about STEM, but what about uh, implications for manufacturing careers specifically? So, you know, I think with manufacturing careers, creating that your activity can be more challenging, especially if it's something where there's large equipment. And then I, I think really forming a partnership, if you can do a field trip, um, you know, that's something that um, would be very uh, impactful. I know that I just wrote a grant with, um, some folks from Boeing around aviation, and we were trying to cr create sort of a sample activity, right, that we would create from this um, content, and you know, we're talking about airplanes, right, so we really had to think about um, what would be engaging, I mean, often kids are excited when they think about airplanes, but what would be engaging, what would be something we could do in a classroom, and we came up with some activities that are more sort of connected to physics, Right. So th thinking thinking about something that's connected, um, but, you know, maybe you don't have access to the equipment or the place that it's actually happening. Interaction. Tracy says we took a robot built by our newly work sponsored students, which brings many interests of others. Oh, that's great. And that's, you know, having um, on site tours. Right. I know that um, one really successful um, role model visit we had once is we had two women who worked on the robot that uh, goes underwater that helps when there are oil spills. Um, we had them bring that into the classroom and talk about developing that robot. And um, that that has been one of our most engaging uh, projects because um, most young people care about the environment and um, wild, you know, fish and wildlife, and for them to talk about this robot that they developed that goes and helps clean up oil spills um, was pretty exciting. So if you have access to bringing those sorts of things in, um, and right, that's right, this is uh, funded by Toyota, so we're talking about um, manufacturing as well. I know one of the things that I think might be interesting with um, automobile manufacturing is um, all of the sensors now that they put on new cars that can be really helpful in terms of safety, right? Um, and that in many ways is connected to um, artificial intelligence and you can make some really interesting connections to how those new um, features on cars can really save lives. So I don't, I think that's the end of my content. I don't think I can answer this question. How do you get the school to participate in on-site tours? Um, and I, th I think that's more about connecting with the plant, right? I should turn that back over to you, Kathleen. So I think uh, my understanding is Tracy works with Toyota and they use their AMT students to participate in recruiting for high school students into AMT. So great. 
Well, Karen, thank you so much you're for very, very valuable, uh, insightful, so much content. I'm turning back on my camera and just wanted to take the last five minutes to um, review for everyone, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, we have, um, if you're part of this project, um, <clears throat> just to encourage you that to utilize the learning management system. And if for whatever reason uh, you're not able to, um, let us know and we can get you connected. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and uh, if we're always interested in um, uh, feedback on how usable it is. I know at one of our last conversations, the folks at Toyota said LMS has a bad connotation. So um, we may think about just changing the acro acronym. Anyway, um, but a uh, lot of useful tools and some some uh, online learning resources there for for recruiters and educators. Um, just uh, to remind everyone that uh, participating in this project will uh, give you some increased knowledge, giving you access to tools, but more importantly, and the reason why we're doing these table talks is to um, broaden your network of folks who are also interested in increasing participation of females in manufacturing as well as, as STEM more broadly. Um, and ultimately, we're looking to help you increase your participation in your programs, whether you're at the uh, AMT uh, level at the community colleges or in high school, trying to encourage students to get involved in pre-manufacturing courses or Project Lead the Way. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Um, one of the things I would like to encourage you to do in the materials section, there is a, again, just a reminder, the nine best practices complete document is there. Um, but lastly, if you wouldn't mind taking just five minutes to, um, after we wrap up here, go to our table talk evaluation and give us some feedback on how today went and uh, any suggestions for our future table talks. Um, let's see, Lisa, if you're still there, I'd ask you to come on. Um, I don't have the schedule for the next table talk, but I know that you have confirmed our, our guest speaker. Are you able to um, share that with us real briefly? Sorry, kind of calling you out here. Um, and well, uh, looks like looks like can she. Can you hear me? Yep. Now we can hear you. Thanks, Lisa. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, the next. I was talking, and then I'm like, nobody's responding. Um, <laughs> uh, the next table talk is on March 6th at 10 a.m. And Cindy um, Thorngan is going to be talking to us about m mentoring and um, what she has done with with uh, preparing mentors to work with students. And so I will be getting. Uh, bio and headshot from her soon and when we send the invitation out we'll be giving some more information about background and um and what she can offer to the conversation uh thank you lisa yes the and and i think that mentoring and role models are all uh tools in our toolbox that that are, as Karen mentioned earlier, is critical for allowing girls to see themselves in these career pathways. Um, let's see, uh, Fred asked, the evaluation to download should be in the materials section of your control panel for this, um, uh, for the course here. And um, if, you all are not able to access it. I've got your email so I can send you a, an email with the link as well. Um, a copy of today's presentation. Um, Karen, if you're still out there, if you're comfortable, I can um, create a PDF of the presentation. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, totally fine. Go for okay. it. I'll create a PDF of today's presentation and we'll send that out to you all as well. As well as a copy of this recording will be available uh, to view. So if you want to share this with your colleagues, that would be wonderful. Um, 
And uh, Kathleen, will I, you email the will you email a link to the, to the recording or is it going to be on our YouTube? Uh, it, it, it will both it'll be on the YouTube as well as uh, we'll send out a link when we send out the invitation for the next one. Um, just like we did last time, we put a link of the previous recording in the in the body of the invitation. Great. So we are straight up on the hour. Thank you again, Karen, for your time this morning and sharing such valuable information. And I appreciate all your time in um, being part of this conversation. And we look forward to having you next time at our um, Make the Future uh, table talk. Thank you again. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.